Gunjan, you know what's the most expensive ship in the world? <laughs> what? Friendship. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> okay. We spend a lot of time and effort and money on that thing. We also miss roundups once in a while. But anyway, good to be back. Uh, hello and welcome to the Startup Operator Roundup. I am Roshan Karyapa. And I'm Gunjan Saha. And together we break down the biggest updates from India's growing startup ecosystem. If this is the first time you're tuning into the channel, then please consider subscribing to it for everything good related to startups. And, and some bad jokes also. And some bad jokes also, as you just noticed. Uh, and if you're a first time listener, we don't just do bad jokes. I mean, uh, once in a while. But uh, stay with us right till the end of this episode. And if you like it, then please like this video and subscribe to it. Um, we missed the roundup last week, but we have some really interesting updates for you. Starting off with Karnataka's new job reservation bill. And uh, the Indian government also passed a union budget this week. So we'll be take, talking about the key highlights of that. Last year, we also saw one of the biggest trends uh, on mm. Twitter about the Microsoft blue screen of death. Oh, man. And our very own Ola is taking the fight to the big dogs like Google. Yeah. Wazirex also got hacked last week and they lost over $235 million. And... India has gifted the world its first CNG motorbike, all thanks to Bajaj Auto. These things aside, Cred has launched a new product in their suite called Cred Money, and Swiggy has successfully executed another ESOP buyback program before uh, going public. Damn. So a lot of exciting topics to discuss this week. Let's get started. It's a bittersweet thing. I've lost about 60 grand, I think, in Wazirx. <laughs> what? Yeah. Why did you still have money Perhaps. in crypto? And, dude, I had to pull it out, but then it had to, you know... That's what she do said. That <laughs> terrible, terrible <laughs> jokes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I had to do a P2P transaction mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. I mean, it was just too tedious. Oh. I've left it there. I'm uh, hoping that hmm. at least a part of that is still there after the $235 million swindle. <laughs> But uh, yeah, a bit of sweet because we know a few Swiggy folks. Hopefully, mm. you know, hopefully. Yet they'll never call us. Yeah. Except for the uh, delivery guys. What a, uh, like seriously. Huh. So many ESOP buybacks and not even one party guys. I mean, this sucks. So please change that. If you're listening to this podcast and you are uh, a Swiggy person, uh, not a delivery guy, but hey, who knows? I mean, hey, yeah, a delivery huh. guy also. Yeah. Give us a biryani at least. Come on. <laughs> right. So... <laughs> All right, let's get uh, started. I think it's pretty eventful this week, yeah? Oh, yeah. Apart from all the shenanigans we're seeing in the US, we have <laughs> some of our own drama uh, happening in India. Let's start off with Karnataka's new job reservation bill. Now, according to this uh, bill, which has now been kept on hold, it was said that around 75% of all uh, jobs should be reserved for Karnataka's and 100% of all grade C and grade D staff should be Karnataka's, right? Um, this received a lot of backlash across all social media platforms. Uh, what is your take on it? I mean, you have you have been born and brought up in Bangalore. Yeah, of course, I'm a proud uh, Kanadiga. Uh, look, I mean, I get it. I know that there are displaced people uh, in any growing uh, metropolitan city as hmm. Bangalore has been. I mean, Bangalore has been on this hyper growth path for the last 20, 25 years. And uh, there are people who feel that uh, they need to be a stake uh, in the growth uh, and they're not quite having it at this point, right? Uh, things have gotten expensive, jobs are scarce for those uh, folks, they have to compete with, uh, you know, people from uh, everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not just from the north, I mean, from other parts in the south as well. Uh, but this is uh, what it is like for any city that is prominent, right? I mean, you look at SF or London or Singapore. Singapore is a city state, but still, right? I mean, you have people coming in and competing for, you know, resources, wealth and whatnot. But I think the way to solve this is to look at the other end of the spectrum, right? I mean, instead of looking at jobs, I would really look at education and skilling and so on. Uh, and to that end, you know, the, the budget has been uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, right, we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, you know, when we discuss that segment. But uh, otherwise, on the reservation side, I mean, it's, it's absurd. So first thing is, this is not new. Every few years, uh, uh, some government or the other decides that they need a reservation in the private sector, uh, right? They moot this and it's almost never passed, right? 
Uh, also, I don't think it's constitutional as well. I think most likely the courts will strike it down, even if it is uh, passed uh, in some way, hmm. right? The second thing is it is absolutely impossible to implement as well, right? I mean, it has things like 50% of the management has to be from, uh, you know, the, the state itself. Now, as a proud Kannada guy, I can say that, you know, we have produced fantastic uh, tech folks, business folks, uh, who have competed at the high le highest level without requiring any such reservations. But even we will not be able to fill that quota, right? Uh, so it's almost impossible to implement. And look, the third thing is, uh, you know, I mean, you will just scare the folks uh, uh, from investing in this place, right? Uh, uh, let's face it, you know, uh, Bangalore has been made by all of these folks coming in and pouring in money, uh, right, and building infrastructure and so on and so forth. So the second and third order impact of this has not been uh, entirely negative, right? I mean, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the gig economy that has opened up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so many of these folks uh, have come in from, uh, you know, uh, Hassan, North Karnataka, etc. and have become drivers here um, uh, and uh, delivery folks and so on and so forth, earning, you know, 20, 25K a month, which uh, would have been like a, a rich person's wage in the city, in the village that they were living in, right? Yeah. I mean, all of these folks have gotten employment. Uh, I think the idea should be to enlarge this pie, right? Rather than like try to divide it among, you know, whoever is here. Uh, that's not the right way to look at it, mm. I feel. Um, uh, Samir Nigam of uh, PhonePay, I mean, expressed his views pretty strongly on uh, mm. Twitter and then he had some blowback and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, look, any city changes and I will be the first to confess that Bangalore doesn't at all resemble the Bangalore that I grew up in. Right. Uh, at the time I grew up in, it was a pensioner's paradise. Uh, right. There were wide roads, very scarce traffic. And uh, yeah, I mean, you could speak Kannada pretty much everywhere. Right. Today, I mean, if I were to uh, go to Ganesh Juice Center, I mean, he will still say mango chahiye kya. Right. <laughs> so uh, it is different. I mean, it's, it's difficult to cope. You know, while I see the economics 101 argument of, you know, this is the wrong thing to do via reservations and so on and so forth. I also see the sort of emotional uh, side to this that, uh, you know, the city has changed beyond recognition, right? Um, but the way to fix it is is not through that, mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. But do you think this is like the government actually trying to manage the, the deterioration of infrastructure? Because with the growth in population, infrastructure is crumbling, right? And this is not the first time that the state government is taking steps to, you know, do something exclusive for Kannadigas. For example, there was a law which again got tabled, I think, a few months back where you had to declare the number of uh, Kannadigas working in the company. Then uh, most, even more recently, another law is being discussed where uh, about 14-hour uh, working, 14-hour workdays. It's ridiculous. None of this will ever come into effect, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's very harebrained, I mean, if I might say so. Uh, right. Look, I mean, roads benefit everyone, right? Yeah. Not just Connecticut's, <laughs> right? I mean, we've just seen the silk board fly over and it's made my life uh, a lot better, you know, uh, in the mornings. So uh, I will buy the population growth is untenable argument. If you're saying that we're building, you know, one flyover every four years or three years and two years, and it's not even still then, you know, we're not able to keep pace, uh -huh. right? But when things take, uh, you know, 10 years, 12 years, and so on, right? I mean, uh, uh, that's that's no argument at all, right? And uh, uh, it used to be uh, for us that uh, the state and the central government were always different parties. But I mean, mm. we did have, you know, uh, BJP at the center, BJP at the state, and we did see some funds come into, uh, you know, the state as well. But how the much metros of that did open up. Yeah, exactly. Metros did open mm. up and folks in Whitefield can't stop raving about it, <laughs> right? The fact that they can get to Indranagar in 30 minutes and so on. Uh. So it's a solvable problem, right? I mean, any other city uh, elsewhere in the world has had to see these kind of problems and they have solved it through world-class infrastructure, right? Uh, they have not solved it through reservations. Um, and, and if you really want that demographic dividend in the state to benefit from schemes, then I would say launch education, skilling, employment schemes, right? See, we have largely for the longest period, we have just outsourced all of the skilling to industry, yeah. right? Today, I mean, we assume that a person graduating from engineering college knows how to read, write, and perhaps think. That's about it. Hmm. That's the level at which we assume, right? Um, and I mean, Infosys famously pioneered this uh, 20 years back. I mean, they put these people 
uh, at their Mysore uh, center and literally made them, you know, do all like of the stuff. Redo engineering. Exactly. In okay. three to six months and yeah. get them industry ready. Right. And, and the industry at large has kind of adopted that model in, in varying proportions. Right. Uh, why don't we make industry ready uh, people? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, why not that? Why not? Uh, for the longest time, I've been saying that we need to have the erstwhile ITI uh, kind of manufacturing specialized skill learning centers. Uh, really, again, I mean, with a focus on manufacturing, again, from the central uh, uh, government, we could definitely gain on that front as well. But instead, I mean, we haven't done any of those things, right? And you look at how Telangana is moving, you look at how Gujarat is moving, um, right? You look at how Maharashtra is also, again, punching uh, about its weight in the last, like, maybe like four years or so, right? I mean, everyone's trying to gain more industry and so on, whereas mm -hmm. we are sending the opposite signals here. So, yeah. It will be interesting to hear from, you know, the founders we have on the podcast as to what, to, what they think about this. Okay, so that's what's happening in the state of Karnataka. Now let's shift our focus on the national level. The union budget was also announced a few days back. And here are the key takeaways for startup from the latest budget. Starting off with, the biggest highlight was the abolition of angel tax. Yes. The government has abolished all angel tax on all classes of investors to boost the startup ecosystem. A thousand crore venture capital fund will also be set up for investments in the space economy. Yeah. Public-private partnerships for e-commerce export hubs will be established to facilitate access to international markets. And this will very, very well benefit the MSMEs and traditional artisans in India. Rules for uh, FDI have also been simplified to facilitate their inflow and promote use of rupees for overseas investments. The TDS rate on e-commerce operators have also been reduced from 1% to just 0.1%. The corporate tax rate for foreign companies have also been cut from 40% to 35%. Capital gains tax have also been simplified. Uh, Short-term gains are reduced to 20% and long-term gains on certain assets are taxed at 12.5%. But in the wider public, this has not been received very well. Uh, across social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatnot, it is saying that this budget is again there to, you know, if you make money, you're taxed. If you don't make money, you're taxed. If you're paying taxes, you're still taxed on that. See, there are only two constants in life, death and taxes, <laughs> right? So it's better you accept it right now and uh, worry about all of the stuff that you can do outside of it than, mm -hmm. you know, crib about this. But anyway, this is like annual outrage. It will die down, uh, right? I've been seeing this forever. But uh, see, the last point that you mentioned, right? the LTCG and the short-term capital gain. Hmm. Now, earlier there was a difference between listed assets and unlisted assets, right? The stock you hold in unlisted entities, which is like startups and so on hmm. and so forth, they have been, you know, brought on par with listed assets now, right? Okay. So as <clears> a startup founder, as an employee, I mean, it just got better for you, right? So maybe you might have to pay that additional 2.5% you know, uh, on your, uh, you know, HDFC or whatever else. Uh, Publicly treated stocks. Yeah, I keep talking about HDFC so much. People <laughs> must think like, yeah. you know, I'm sitting in with Deepak Parekh and uh, the CEO and so on and discussing strategy mm. or something. But <laughs> no, but major HDFC fan. Didn't you used to do that though? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that's the thing, right? Uh, so unlisted assets have been rationalized now. Uh, we will publish... An episode, or likely it has been published by the time you're listening to it, uh, with Devendra Agarwal, who is uh, founder at Dexter Capital. Um, you know, he had some very interesting thoughts on the budget, uh, specifically how it relates to startups. Uh, definitely check that out. We're publishing perhaps only on our YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and while you're at it, uh, do like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. So, in my opinion, I think, look, the government has done a good job in articulating what their priorities are right? Uh, so for instance, if you look at um, jobs and employment, there are three schemes that they've launched, right? Uh, more or less to support this whole employee, employer uh, provident fund, mm -hmm. right? Uh, th then they've launched this uh, NPS as well, National P Pension Sch uh, System. They've given that an upgrade as well. Uh, so these two or three schemes... Even to there's another scheme on skill development. Correct, exactly. Yeah. So um, all of this is a recognition that yes, we need more jobs and perhaps... There has been, uh, you know, more growth over the last like two, three years uh, in comparison to the amount of jobs that we need and so on. 
this jobs data is a little dicey we have discussed this earlier because we have such an informal hmm. uh, economy so it's hard to see the numbers but still from whatever we can get uh, they've realized that and they've incentivized more on the uh, employment and skilling side of things um, that aside i think angel tax it was long due uh, that it had to go i mean there were exemptions on top of exemptions being made and and i'm glad and i think pretty much everyone is relieved right now that that is off the table right uh, it's been like a Can you, you know, know, like explain what angel tax is for our listeners? So angel tax basically was mooted in I think 2012, right? And it was basically to extract fair market value, right? Now this fair market value of assets, especially when you're talking about private unlisted companies, is a dicey situation, right? Uh, it is really valued at how much someone will pay for it, mm, yeah. right? um and you can uh, understand you know how much of this is ambiguous and gray area when it comes to startups right and at very very early stages uh and and so on so the government had uh, mooted that you know you have to end up paying uh taxes on um, uh, some of these unrealized assets as well um but since then i mean there have been various sort of exceptions uh, being made to that over the last uh, i would say 10 12 years uh, particularly over the last 3 4 years and now that is uh, been taken off the table which is fantastic news uh, anyway um, right but uh, overall there's a greater impetus on uh, defense for instance uh, minerals um, mm. and a lot uh, of space tech that you mentioned yeah. like creating a fund of funds uh, that 1000 crore can go into plenty of other different uh, you know um, vc funds or whatever else incubators accelerators mm. i think cetera. that that aspect of it is needs to be further defined more clarity is required how that fund is going to be used but i think another big takeaway from the uh, budget announcement was the pli schemes yeah. we have seen how pli schemes have been really beneficial in giving a boost to certain industries like your ev your energy your uh, steel exports yeah these See, uh, the, have gained a lot look i mean a lot of people th- seem to think that the budget is basically about tax right <laughs> and sure i mean i think tax is one of those primary uh, instruments uh, that the government has in order uh, to generate revenue and so on and so forth but really i mean it is about the economy it's about what we decide to focus on where we go growing and so on and so forth right so you have to have a sort of a macro view of things hmm. um we still have this mindset of you know tax cuts sops reservations so on and so forth i think we will have to think beyond that in terms of like how the economy is going to grow and how much value of that we're going to capture right and <laughs> people also have this like weird uh, uh, sort of a make up in their head that you know they're earning 30 40 50 lakhs and still consider themselves middle class um you know india is really poor guys uh, india has had 2500 or 3000 dollars per capita uh if you do earn 30 40 or 50 lakhs you are likely in the top 5 10% of the country and uh, there's a whole lot of money that has to go into uh services uh, for the less privileged right um in, in that sense you also have to do that you have to spend on those people who are less privileged and fortunate uh, and deprived of basic stuff in life and plus you should also balance your budget and you know not let your fiscal defi- deficits uh, spiral out of control it's a very very hard job okay hmm. um you've seen over the last 3 uh, 4 years post covid especially how governments everywhere have just recklessly spent money uh right and look and at what happening to us right i US, think this us debt, debt is, is going uh, to surpass exactly. the gdp i mean look at their interest payments it's ridiculous like ridiculous absolutely ridiculous right uh so i mean when you look at all of that right i mean it's a hard decision i sometimes think about you know how you know when if you grew up in a middle class house right and you ask dad if you know you could have that cycle or go out for dinner mm-hmm. you know couple of days in on the trot or something you know your dad had to sort of decide if he's <laughs> going to do that or something else um and sometimes he took very unpopular decisions right but thank god for him that you know all of us like are gainfully occupied right <laughs> <laughs> right and helpful members of society uh so it it's hard look i mean i hate paying taxes uh i hate paying 30% or whatever whatever else um and especially it irritates me when you know it rains for example and the garage floods or uh, you know uh, I, i go over these many different potholes 
of various shapes and sizes on the roads but i tend to be an optimist i worry about the things i can control and don't uh, spend too much time on all these constraints that are unchangeable right yeah. irrespective of yeah man damn <laughs> <laughs> irrespective <laughs> irrespective of governments you will be taxed right 100% you will be taxed just think of it as your contribution to the nation's progress um and forget about it really just no. forget about what it what an optimistic way to look at yeah, it yeah yeah i mean <laughs> look we take shit for granted man i'm telling you like if you compare with any of these other thriving cities in the world whether it's san francisco or london when i say thriving i mean like prosperous uh, cities i mean in comparison we have a great life right if yeah. you are quote and quote middle class in <laughs> india right or in bangalore yeah. right you can afford all nature of services right drivers maids house helps cooks uh, deliveries deliveries order mm-hmm. out you don't have to spend your weekend doing laundry or meal prep uh, right which even folks who are earning 100k 150k in the us tend to do that right mm-hmm. um and but you don't do your laundry <laughs> i mean i do but then i mean it, it's not such a big deal yeah, right? it's not I a mean, big it's, deal it's not a big deal yeah. right uh, you can you know you can go out pretty much every day of the night if you want i mean every day of the week not every day of the night <laughs> but uh, there are all these things and somehow yet somehow in a in a country of 1.4 1.4 billion people with like woefully short capacity right you have way less police people uh, here than you re- need you have way less of everything government judges etc etc somehow this society functions right Hmm. um and uh, if you compare statistically also like the crime is on a relative scale is on the lower side compared to you know one of these uh, places I, i know for a fact that sf and london are like absolute yeah. shit holes when it comes to crime and so on right so these are things that we take for granted but i mean this is obviously like you know adding to the quality of life right no i know this is a touchy subject and people's opinions may differ but as i said i am an optimist i tend to look at the glass half full and also drink it once a while so <laughs> that's me you know what happened when i was filing my income tax this time crash to <laughs> <laughs> no i i got a notice from the income tax department saying ki you are making false uh, claims on your incomes and i'm like wait like how how can that be hey, what, not that what shady business are you it's not that the, the gap will be like crores or rupees right probably okay fine some minor calculation error but on going through that in detail and like talking to people i realized i did not declare crypto assets <laughs> <laughs> and having crypto meant you had to file a different form it's itr 3 uh, see anything the government does not like it will tax like crazy right from crypto to options trading <laughs> to uh, you know gaming and so yeah. on and so forth uh, tax is uh, an instrument basically that is an instrument for danda hmm. yeah <laughs> okay very few people are enjoying these the way taxes are growing yeah, let's but talk anyway, about something yeah. else let's talk about the blue screen of death uh so wow. is <laughs> I, i thought we could talk about something <laughs> optimistic but yeah so um because of crowd strike a lot of windows machines around the world crashed and to show in the blue screen of death this affected windows users globally due to a faulty software upgrade from crowd strike approximately 8.5 million windows devices were affected but that number represents less than 1% of machines worldwide but the repercussions were pretty huge we saw airlines stop functioning banks stop functioning um then there were interruptions in services like healthcare as well mm. right and all of these due to one error on the software side yeah you know sometimes uh, you realize how fragile all our systems are right as we get more and more and more and more digitized right uh, you realize you know that you are becoming as fragile as possible mm. right like if you think about covid i don't think it would have affected as many people 20 years back Hmm. you know we were less connected then and uh, look um, i still belong to the generation that had this pretty periodically right these kind of uh, hacking and outages and so on and so forth we saw that bsod screen way more than you guys right um, but it's pretty unfortunate i mean crowd strike has done phenomenally well over the last 10 years or so they're generating about 3 billion something in revenue hmm. 
uh, and the CEO is somewhat of a maverick, right? I mean, he worked in McAfee also. And incidentally, <laughs> around 2007, 2008 time, <laughs> the previous largest outage also was, you know, under his leadership, wow. right? Kind of raises some questions, don't you? Uh, think? It's an unfortunate <laughs> thing. I mean, uh, you work in security long enough. I mean, this is going to happen, right? I mean, and when and it's also such a thankless job when nothing happens, nobody like mm. cares, and when something like this happens, obviously, like all guns are, you know, uh, mm. ablaze. But uh, Strategy had a good piece on this, uh, right? In terms of just how we ship software, right? I mean, for me, it's it's weird that this update was shipped to all computers all at once. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, even for less important things, we always batch these, right? I mean, uh, so you can... But these are like entire airlines, banks, hospitals and Yeah, whatnot. because see, endpoint uh, security and so on, right? I mean, it's at the kernel level. So so this is very deep. I mean, it's not like an application or something like that, right? And upon it, apparently it was like a null point error, which is like a 101 of like coding. <laughs> You're throwing like really big words, kernel... <laughs> Null point. This See, is something I learned in college during my classes and I slept off. No, but <laughs> suffice to say that it's a very like fundamental, very simple thing mm -hmm. that uh, uh, ruined this, right? And uh, I, don't, I don't know how many billions of dollars uh, worth of, uh, you know, value was destroyed. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sucks. But glad to see that everyone's back and, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> you know, enterprises will use this to sort of migrate to the second or third best <laughs> perhaps in the industry. Um, right and let's see I mean this, this is pretty regular it keeps happening and I expect that more things will happen actually I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often to be honest I thought you were an optimist <laughs> no which is why I'm optimistic about it I mean it happens once a while yeah sure sure you know unless you are on a flight stranded and so on in which case I mean my sympathies to you yeah don't be on a flight be in the airport <laughs> <laughs> yeah <shut up>. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's talk about Cruzrim that is Really shaking up Google's monopoly in India. Ooh. <laughs> so Google had recently announced an India-specific pricing for its Maps API with up to 70% lower prices uh, on most of their APIs. Ola, uh, what they are doing is they are introducing a free tier for all of its mapping and location-based APIs to developers, allowing up to 5 million API calls per month at no cost. Ola is also partnering with ONDC to offer three years of free access to Ola Maps APIs for all startups and small businesses operating on ONDC. Uh, here is a chart to show how the pricing for Ola Maps uh, come up to. And if you compare this with Google, you'll see the difference. But it was quite ironic that Google pushed this update just two, three days after Bhavish took to LinkedIn and announced this. Um, see, Maps is essentially a monopoly business. Mm -hmm. right? oh, but, but wait, let me let me also see this. Yeah. Ola Map Service is absolutely is nowhere Dropship. close. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as trying to book, as trying to order food uh, using yeah. using Ola, and that that has already integrated with the Ola Maps. It was for me. I'm somewhere in North Karnataka. It's hard, man. I mean, again, look, we take these things for granted, but it's hard. No, maps, it's I, I, Google Maps. It is. It is. It is hard. Fifteen years back was. I'm telling you, people mm. wouldn't rely on it so effectively, right? Mm. Even now, sometimes, I mean, we were discussing that flyover, the thing, flyover right? thing, I'm always confused, right? Uh, whether, you know, to go towards the left or take mm. the flyover and so on. I, and it's a simple UX change, right? I mean, it, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. But the first version of anything will be like dog shit, right? And then it gets a little less dog shit and so on <laughs> and so forth. And after 10 years, you have a great product, right? Hopefully mm. you have customers along the way who will tolerate your dog shit releases, <laughs> right? But uh, Map My India is a fantastic example, right? I mean, they've been at it for 30 years now, I feel. Uh, they had a pretty successful IPO. Um, so they are, again, an indigenous company doing this. We definitely need indigenous solutions, right? Because Google Maps pretty much has been like a monopoly business for a long time, hmm. uh, right? And they definitely need competition. And guess what? I mean, when you don't have competition, you control price, right? And Google Maps uh, API is expensive. It's really expensive. Yeah, I, I mean, we've seen this in the company that we worked as well, right? <laughs> Um, if uh, you're not prudent about, uh, you know, optimizing your code and so on and so forth. Yeah. You can pay up to 100, no, 80% more than what you should be paying. Yeah. I mean, infinite percent more than what uh, you should be paying for sure. Right. I mean, there's no dearth of that, mm -hmm. but uh, it's good to see that uh, there is an alternate in the market for sure. Okay. And props to Bavish as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think. Do you think it's right to compare Bhavish to Elon, <laughs> like the Indian Elon for the way you know he's going, his approach to building companies, always aggressive, always out there taking the fight, and being unfazed by all the critic. Comments. See, I'm sure he's taking a leaf out of Elon's book, uh, for sure, right? Mm. And it's good to have these kind of people, man. I mean, mavericks. I mean, the kinds who you may not truly appreciate, uh, right? Who will be a little rougher on the edges, mm. who will take those wild swings. uh once in a while they do things that completely transform humanity right um Damn. <laughs> Dude, you are at no on fire man <laughs> hey i think it's the is the tea <sighs> but uh but it's good uh, elon again is such an outlier right i mean uh, i was watching this um, podcast with uh, peter thiel and uh, peter thiel says that at the time elon pitched spacex Hmm. He thought it was <coughs> completely nuts, right? And imagine Peter and Elon uh, have worked together for a while, right? At PayPal and at so PayPal, on. Yeah. I mean, not the best relationships, <laughs> but uh, you know, someone who has worked so closely with you can think that about that kind of idea. I mean, and Peter Thiel is like a super smart chap, right? I mean, uh, perhaps the one of the smartest investors um, in the world today. um it was such a preposterous idea right spacex and think of neuralink think of um, any of these things tesla or solar city or yeah, there was some other yeah so we talk about boring man there was a wild idea to construct tunnels it's insane it's insane hmm. i mean imagine going and telling people you want to populate mars <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a absurd idea even now yeah. but it's getting less absurd every year you know yeah. so you need people doing this and while it is not at the level of okay we'll populate mars but saying that hey we definitely need an alternate for google maps is important saying that we definitely need an indian alternate for aws or uh, microsoft uh, azure and so on is definitely important you know hmm. uh, maybe may not be at that scale but at some scale it is definitely important right and we need to have more entrepreneurs take these large uh wildly consequential bets i feel yeah. okay let's talk about wazir x they got hacked last week and lost over 235 million dollars um, along with my 60000 <laughs> bucks <laughs> really like you lost money look i mean i have pretty much considered it lost i mean i'm not able to no. transact so middle class <laughs> yeah i have this okay anyway uh, this hacking was attributed to a north korean hacking organization called lazarus group though nothing concrete has been proven yet uh, but one question which i want to raise over here right when cryptocurrency was all the boom uh, in 2021 and that time it said that this is unhackable it's the most secure um, you know form of technology blockchain um, and i did some research and what i came across is that yes it is unhackable it is code protected and uh, difficult to crack through it but the hacking happens on the wallet level which is a hardware yeah. and on the human level through like phishing and what not see no technology is unhackable okay um you will have to pretty much you know <laughs> develop a machine at your house and be the one person who's using it <laughs> solely for your own whatever purposes uh, to you know uh, not be hacked anything connected <laughs> to a network can be hacked for sure right um but man exchanges exchanges guard i think the trust deficit is at an all time low at this yeah. point of time the trust rather the trust is at an all time low right i mean we've seen one after another how these have imploded from ftx to binance to um you know some of our indian guys yeah. i mean it, it's tough look it's really tough and i think uh, over the last couple of years the really serious folks are you know people who are still investing in crypto have all moved to cold wallets and stuff like that right so uh, they made their own arrangements no one is really no one serious is really relying on uh, you know exchanges as such mm-hmm. um it's tough really there's a lot of other applications being built on top of web3 and <clears throat> crypto for example and i know this uh, person called pranav yerabati mm. he is the founder of this company called stationx that does crowdsourcing through crypto for you know startups see for the longest time i've said that blockchain right as a technology is awesome yeah. right we have to develop real world use cases for that beyond what you know we saw over the last like 4 years right which is your doge coin and yeah. stuff Just right create a coin put it on an exchange yeah. make some money. i mean we'll have to develop real use cases for this 
the Maharashtra government was issuing, uh, I think, caste certificates or something on that. I mean, they had they had a pilot going. I mean, then, Tilangana, huh? Tilangana or Andhra, they did land land, land records. records yeah. yeah, land records again, right? I mean, if you look at the cases outstanding in front of the uh, courts today, I would hazard a guess and say 20-25% are all land related, right? Okay. Maybe more. Um, and, you know, we just spoke about the famously short state capacity. If there is a blockchain solution to help with that, that will be amazing. Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So, I really hope that, you know, folks develop more innovative solutions on blockchain. Yeah. Talking about innovative solutions, Bajaj Auto is taking a step towards a, a more greener, sustainable world. Uh, they launched the world's first CNG two-wheeler called Bajaj Freedom 125. It is positioned to cater to price-conscious customers. It is expected to lower the running cost of a two-wheeler by almost 50%. Uh, there are a few challenges which EV faced and like why it is not as popular as you know we thought it would be. Although it's growing, it's because of high upfront costs and range anxiety and a lack of charging infrastructure. And I think CNG is going to... CNG two-wheelers could just fill in that spot, you know, be the transitionary phase because we do have substantial CNG uh, infrastructure across the country thanks to, you know, public transports. And, well, uh, CNG also gives you good mileage compared to petrol and electric. See, I think it can at best be a halfway solution to the end utopia, right? Uh, if you ask Elon, I mean, he considers his Tesla cars as robots, right? <laughs> robots that serve a purpose. Uh, I am not sure that vision can be realized on CNG, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, ultimately, I think your bike or car or any automobile is going to become like one software upgrade away from doing things very differently from mm. than the previous version, right? Uh, right now, uh, I think I came across an ad by Audi, uh -huh. right, where through a software upgrade, you can enable uh, headlights automatically turning on uh, if there's a car coming. All in. kinds of stuff, <laughs> all kinds of stuff, right? Um uh, and I don't know. I mean, maybe, I mean, it could uh, uh, it, it could be, like, attractive to folks uh, who are running fleets, right? Uh, where, again, it needs to be cost-effective and so on and so forth. But, again, Bajaj not fully committing to EV is, uh, is again, I, I don't know, right? I mean, it's a bit of a signal to me that perhaps, I mean, their electric bikes or vehicles are not doing as well, hmm. right? And... Uh, um, who knows? I mean, we've spoken to uh, quite a lot of folks, right? I mean, Bounce and uh, the others in the EV ecosystem as well. And everyone is full steam going up ahead. Uh, uh, sales have increased year on year, despite all of the mishaps mm -hmm. that have happened, right? I think range anxiety will go away with uh, better quality batteries, a better infrastructure. And that is the direction in which it is trend, uh, mm -hmm. trending anyway. Uh, the government emphasis is also huge in terms of EVs and sustainable energy and so on, right? I mean, see, whatever commitments we've made on the, you know, environment front uh, in terms of being net zero by 2070 and whatnot, we will need all ways to become sustainable, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, this is uh, another way to reach that goal, I would say. Awesome. Great, this week uh, added another product to its list of uh, features in the app. This one is called Cred Money. What Cred Money essentially does, it helps you track your expenses across multiple accounts and provides a consolidated transaction history, summaries, and tells you where you're spending money and how. Um, for recurring payments such as SIPs, EMIs, rent, salaries, and whatnot, they'll also send you reminders. And this development is coming at a time after Cred secured an in-principle approval from RBI for payment aggregator license in April. Now, it's a great feature. I mm. really wanted to use it because I struggle managing multiple bank accounts and keep track of expenses. Damn. <laughs> multiple bank accounts. Middle class. Middle class. <laughs> <laughs> Just your average middle <laughs> class guy. Uh, but what also hit me was that I know that if I use this, right, I know I'm going to get unwanted calls about credit applications and whatnot. Of course. Of course. See, this is just a, this is the tip of the spear. This is not a business in itself. This is a hook, hmm. basically, right? And uh, people have been trying to solve this consolidated view of all of your financial transactions for at least 15 years that I can remember, 
right i used to use this uh, app called walnut which yeah. would read your sms and then like mm. you know give you a pretty dashboard on you know where your expenses are going and so on and so forth uh, right uh, but you know it has various integration compliance all of these issues i mean it does come up once in a while right uh, uh, i mean to solutions that provide this mm. so i don't know how these folks are going to manage i mean maybe we have caught up uh right now to be able to provide this i mean to do this but yeah it will be like hugely valuable uh but they will have to use this as something to build a business on top of right i mean some some kind of product or service on top of that right maybe like once they have transaction history they'll understand like who is more credit worthy and offer you products and so on that's but the whole but is this is this game, just right? for the credit community like so essentially what is it credit is the top 1% of credit score customers right and then cred launched garage cred launched mint what not and now more recently cred money mm. now understanding whatever underwriting factors are, are there for that 1% club you're going to sell loans back to them yeah in any way that is what i mean they can do anyway right i mean it's not like a <laughs> it's not like a financial company can sell you cars <laughs> or air conditioners so okay. interesting but yeah i mean folks let us know if you're going to see but this whole unsecured loans business in india is still like a hugely untapped area mm-hmm. right um indian you know banks and uh, so on i mean prefer hard assets right home cars land mm-hmm. etc etc the unsecured loan is uh, hugely lucrative right um someone's going to build a mega business on this and there are a thousand use cases why you need these loans right i mean maybe uh, you need money to manage five more days of the month before you get your salary maybe you had some unforeseen expense um right maybe you max out on your credit card and you want to pay that amount at a lesser interest maybe there are a thousand maybe and mm. somebody will build or likely many different people will build you know businesses along different use cases for this right so yeah all right finally we reach talking about our friends in swiggy um but before that one fact here is in july of 2021 zomato executed india's largest ease of buyback program which was valued almost around 700 crore rupees still no party from any zomato <laughs> folks no coupons i think we should launch an email campaign <laughs> And now following on similar lines Swiggy is buying back around 65 million dollars worth of ESOPs. This is the fifth liquidity event in the company. Mm. New investors will purchase employee shares in a transaction which will be valuing the company at over 9 billion dollars. Wow. The valuation multiple is approximately wait for it <laughs> around 140x and this is calculated by dividing 9 billion by 65 million dollars. So in overall the company has generated over 1000 crores in liquidity for its employees and that's great but this valuation number really stuck out for me 140x mm yeah, very generous very kind but it's only 65 million dollars chump change i mean not exactly well, chump change but uh, yeah. v- very generous uh, for sure if you right? had if you had 1 million dollars would you call it chump change i mean middle class <laughs> it depends on on like what the whole pie is right i mean when you mm. compare like a few billion dollars with 65 million it's significant but it's not like bank breaking mm-hmm. significant so um yeah it's good i mean awesome man <laughs> we're still pending parties but you know uh. let it be it's okay no chump change for us <laughs> okay before we move on to the talk of the town section here is a quick recap of all the notable fundraises that went on uh dharana capital acquired over 400 crore rupees in urban company through a secondary transaction then we have blue smart um raising 24 million dollars from responsibility investments suman sena ms dhoni family office and existing investors and blue smart founders themselves lenskart co-founders piyush bansal and neha bansal along with amit chaudhary and sumit kapali have injected 19.12 million dollars in the company Aerio which is a drone startup raised around 15 million dollars from 361 assets startup Exceed Ventures and Navam Capital and Namayatri the trending ride hailing platform in Bangalore raised 11 million dollars from Bloom Ventures Antler Google and other investors awesome and New Me raised 18 million dollars in a series A round which was led by Axel so a lot of popular well known companies yeah uh, Lenskart uh, Namayatri Blue Smart 
I'm very glad to see mm-hmm. Navam Capital there. Yeah. Uh, as well. I mean, these folks have been investing in deep tech for, you know, the last five years. Uh, very much under the radar. Uh, Rajiv Mantri is someone I hope uh, we'll have on the podcast soon. He's also a good friend. So, yeah, uh, amazing. I mean, glad to see money coming into um, mm. deep tech for sure. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. We have a lot of posts for <laughs> talk of the town section. But starting off with It's this. been an eventful <laughs> It's week. It's been an eventful week. So, we all know, right, Indians are built differently. <laughs> Case in point, the Ambani wedding and whatnot. But this one just blows it out of proportions, right? What are Indian engineers like? Take a look at it. Roshan <laughs> writes, Hey, notice you haven't taken any time off in a while. Just checking in. And definitely encourage you to take a break if needed. The engineer replies, I don't need break, sir. My body is a vessel for the company to find product market fit. And then there are talks of working 14 hours a week. Damn. I don't know if that guy was just being sarcastic or just like... <laughs> with them I mean I don't know but uh, yeah it's pretty it's pretty mm. crazy I mean I can I can safely say that's not all Indian engineers for sure mm. right uh, more than a more than a few engineering leaders will agree with me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah okay also uh, Google has uh, pushed in an update to Google Maps and I think this is a very sought after feature Oof. we briefly spoke about it you can yes, finally yes, know yes. if you're supposed to take the flyover <laughs> or not <laughs> I think the number of times I've, you know, gotten lost or had to take a U-turn in Bangalore is too high. It's especially ridiculous, right, in India in general. Or, mm. I mean, we saw this in Chennai, for example, <laughs> right, where you have to take two <laughs> lefts to go right over, or something like five that. Five flyovers in one intersection. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> well, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, ele- Electronic City, for example, mm. right? <laughs> I mean, it's just a maze, man. I mean, it's like the Jetsons or something, you know. You've been to Bhubaneswar, right? Yeah. Did you, did you count the number of flyovers we crossed over there? No, I wasn't keeping count. Okay. Yeah. But <laughs> safe to say that there are a lot of uh, flyovers in India and uh, better UX concerning flyovers is... Mm. I think welcome. the product manager for this feature should get a raise. For sure. Sponsored by Gunjan. <laughs> from sure. one of his many bank accounts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's another video we came across, which... Shows the dystopian gig economy future versus the reindustrialization utopian future that everyone can contribute to, especially Americans. Take a look at it. Yeah, this is pretty badass. Instant grocery sale. <laughs> You have a charge. Okay, ring me away. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I dearly apologize. Yes, we are too, for taking your feedback very seriously. The number of jobs you do. Get a gig that's built to last. <laughs> Careers built to last. dot com. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Really, I mean, I, I you know, gig economy has had many positives, but I think number one thing I would say is like a loss of purpose. You're building half of something, one fourth of something else, and three fourth mm. of like whatever else. Right. I mean, you don't have that sense of belonging that you're doing something significant, you know, and I don't know how much you can do that. You know, you but I've come across many, especially Rapido mm. uh, drivers, right? Um, they 
when i go go back home many of them are like saying ki yeah when i just got done with work you know i you know do this rapid o thing yeah just you can get expenses switch on, for switch off yeah petrol. yeah for sure yeah i mean so that is tremendous right i mean the fact that people can work on their own time hmm. but also i mean we've seen that you know the way incentives are structured uh, and so on and so forth you think you own your time but you're really you're working for the yeah. algorithm you know and that can feel like very dystopian for sure mm. um but i like the the end scene in this right where they're all working to build something yeah uh, that's amazing man i mean there's no equivalent to that i mean uh i can only imagine what it must feel like to be a part of like a rocket that's going up to mars or something you know i mean we feel so proud about software products right i yeah. mean something that could potentially crash the <laughs> <laughs> client's computer but uh, yeah i mean interesting very interesting and i'm glad to see that the us is sort of opening up this thing right i mean uh, you know from from 90s onwards with this whole globalization push everything was outsource 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 in fact i mean if you look at the last wonder how many episodes on seasons of shark tank you mm. only thing you heard is uh, you know do you know how to manufacture this at scale in china that's all right that language and tone and tenor has changed you know yeah. so make uh, america greater again <laughs> perhaps i don't know have you watched the boys no i haven't i've heard oh, ridiculous should, things about you it should watch so. That show. so there's there was the correlation between the boys and the ongoing us elections it's it's like it's scripted dude i feel like this whole thing that we're living is a reality tv show <laughs> a <laughs> truman show yes you know there's this uh, video of gerald ford from god knows when um gerald ford is a us president and he was asked at the time if there will be a, a female us president right hmm. and he and he describes how that will happen and that's exactly what's happening right now you know okay fine i mean i think he was like you know smart guy intelligent for sure perhaps right um but it, it just feels very scripted you know um it could be it could be a i don't know virtual reality we could be living in there who are knows? there knows? are uh, people escape who believe the, that escape the matrix <laughs> <laughs> join the tate <laughs> tate gang <laughs> aren't you part of their community or something guy okay, you know who is the Did most followed person chop your mullet <laughs> Yeah, go on. Do you know who is the most followed person on Twitter right now? Yes, I know. Dan, <laughs> dan. Of course, it's uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji and uh, I'm very glad that he follows me as well. Right? But awesome man, I mean Elon acknowledged that. Hmm, Congratulated yeah. him also. Hopefully he'll cut a little bit of the tax. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but fantastic. I mean, uh, you know, for f- folks who may not know right 2012 2013 was a a wild time to be on twitter you mm-hmm. know people used to f- post about uh, the sandwiches they had <laughs> and uh, generally post music i used to post music around that time i joined mm-hmm. twitter around 20 what was it 2009 2010 perhaps so you would post weird music links or just random musings and so on right i mean it wasn't as popular um, especially in india i would say So yeah I mean uh, Modi ji recognized the technological revolution the social media phenomena way before everyone yeah all right folks with that we come to an end of this rather long round up hopefully interesting <laughs> yeah uh, we covered a lot of exciting developments that happened in the past 2 weeks and maybe there will be more exciting stuff coming up in the next few days as well so make sure you're following us uh, on YouTube on Spotify Apple or any other platform you get your podcasts on and also follow us on social media and if you found any bit of this conversation interesting we hope you did uh, do like this video and read this episode on wherever you listen to your podcasts okay. yeah uh, speaking of podcasts <laughs> we have a couple of uh, good episodes coming up we have uh, prashant sachar who is the co-founder of apps for bharat they have a fantastic app called shree mandir on the app and play stores that have about 3 and 1/2 crore downloads and the conversation focused on building an app led business right growth scale monetization all of those things uh phenomenal insights in that very practical and tactical stuff that you can apply that and we also had uh, devendra agarwal as i mentioned uh, uh founder of dexter capital uh, and quite a unique personality as well he's been an investment banker he's been a founder 
uh, and he's been a VC. So he's kind wow. of seen all of those different roles. Uh, very unique insights, uh, doesn't hold back. Uh, we got talking and we spoke nearly for a couple of hours. Uh, so much so that we had to split the conversation into two. Uh, so I'm yet to record the second half. But uh, again, phenomenal insights on uh, venture capital in 2024. Um, you know, what uh, VCs expect right now, how founders should operate, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, very interesting uh, episodes are uh, coming up. Uh, so stay tuned. All right, guys. See you again next week with another fun conversation. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye.